morning, Greater Shiloh, and welcome to our online service. I'm so excited to be with you today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Christina, uh, uh, aka Pastor K, and I am so excited to be here with you today. Listen, we have been talking about the love revolution for the month of February, and Pastor Phil has done such an amazing job breaking it down and telling us how to love God and how to love ourselves. And now today I'm going to share with you how to love one another. But first, I just want to just uh, say to all of you out there, to the pastors and the elders and the ministers, I just want to give an honor to all of you. And I want to also just take a minute to say thank you to my husband, our pastor, uh, who has given me this privilege to stand behind this holy place and just share the word of God with you. I don't take that lightly at all. And I'm just so grateful. But listen, he's more than just uh, my husband. He is my, he's more than just your pastor. He's my husband and he's my babe. So, you know, at home he doesn't even have a name. So, babe, I just want to take this minute because this is the month of love and say how much I love you. I want to say thank you for loving me the way you do. To, to take, to have an opportunity to share about love is so amazing because I get to, I get to love you and I get to be loved by you every day. So I'm grateful for you, but more than that, I want to give an honor to God because God has called us to this holy place as your pastors and we get to serve you. We get to serve you by sharing the word of God with you. We get to serve you by loving you and supporting you through all of the things that you go through. We get to serve you uh, by being there for you and by uh, just doing whatever needs to be done in your life. And we're grateful for that privilege and that opportunity in our lives to be a part of your lives. So let's get into this word today. Uh, we're going to go straight to the scriptures, and the script, my scripture is a very, very small scripture, and it's going to come from 1 John 3 and 11. I'm telling you, it's short and sweet, and you might memorize it by the end of the sermon, but it goes like this. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's it. In a nutshell, that we should love from love one another. Listen, like the scripture said, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. This is not a new message. This is not something that you're hearing for the first time. This is a message that really, really uh, sums up who God is. Because as we know, God is love. But more than that, if we are going to be disciples of God, then we've got to also be love. So, and we've got to learn to love one another. It's so important, not just to, not just for us, but it's important to God because we represent Him. Love is one of the most uh, difficult topics to talk about in church. It's really, really, it, uh, it's, I, I know it seems like it would be easy, but it's difficult because it's really been so misunderstood. You have scientists who study uh, the brain and how, and how love affects your mind. You have therapists who study uh, uh, the behaviors of love. You have pastors who study the Word of God and teach on love, and it's still misunderstood. And a lot of the reason that it's misunderstood is because of the experiences that we have had in our childhood, because of the things that we've gone through in our lives. Loving one another is one of the hardest things to do for us as Christians because we don't understand what love really is. Well, I hope by the end of the day you understand a little better. I, for Pastor Phil and I, we have a go-to love song by Music Soul Child, and it starts with the lyrics, love so many people use your name in vain. And I love that because that song, those lyrics connotate that there have been those who have manipulated the word I love, the words I love you, the words uh, uh, in love with you. And because so many have misused it, because so many have manipulated the word of the word love, 
a lot of people don't understand what love really, really means. And the fact remains that love has been abused, unfortunately, by so many and mishandled. And this proves that even though we were created to love, we don't really understand how to love. We don't really understand how to receive love. Listen, here's a great definition of love for you. To love is to prioritize someone else's needs above your own. Wow, I love that definition because what it does is it removes all selfishness. There's no room for you to think just about yourself when it comes to love. You have to prioritize someone else's needs above your own. And that's just the way God handled us. When Christ gave his life for us on Calvary, when he hung up on that cross, he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. He was thinking about about us and he was showing his love that he has for all of us. So you ask, we ask, you ask why the love revolution? Why? Because we are trying to teach and disciple people of God to join us as we overthrow, which is the meaning of revolution, overthrow a, a social order of hatred a social order of discrimination, a social order of comparison and competitiveness, a social order of injustice, wars, and every single thing that God has sent love here to obliterate and destroy. We are trying to overthrow that by putting love where it's supposed to be. And the only way that's gonna happen is if us as the body of Christ arises and we begin to be the example Examples that God has ordained us to be before the earth is we if we began to be an extension of Christ and show love in everything that we do everything that we say and in who we are as people of God it is so important to God that we love one another and I you're gonna get used to hearing that word all those two words all throughout this sermon one another one another 60 times in the New Testament the, the words one another are used. God was being intentional about that. He was trying to get us to focus on community. He was challenging us to move beyond our selfish and our self-absorbed perspective of love and of who the one another is. And see, that's where, that's where the dilemma comes in, is that we want to determine who the one another is. We want to make the one another our family, our friends, and maybe a little bit of some of our church family, maybe not all of it, but we want to determine who the one another is. And you see, the difference is that in God's eyes, the one another is not based on you and yours. The one another is based on everybody. God didn't leave anybody out in his attempt to draw them to Christ. He didn't leave anybody out in his mission to save and to seek and save those who are lost. His intention was for us to be an extension to show love to everybody that we come in contact with so that they might experience the love of God through an encounter with us. It is so important that we learn to love who? One another. One another because he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't intend for us to live this life alone. He didn't intend, to us to, intend for us to do life alone. He intended for us to walk out life together. He intended for us to have fellowships and have family dinners and have relationships with one another. He intended for us to encourage one another and serve one another and connect with one another. And the only way that we're going to be able to do those things for one another is if we learn how to what? Love one another. You see, the, the dilemma that of, of, of creating this, this small circle of influence of who the one another is, it, is it, has to, it has to stop. We have to enlarge our territory. And we have to make room for the everybody's, not just the, not just the few, but we have to make room for everybody that God has assigned us to touch in our lives. The Bible says in Matthew 28 and 19, go ye therefore 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I want to add just a little bit to that. Go ye therefore as disciples and make disciples. But here's the thing, is that you, nobody is going to want you to baptize them. Nobody's going to want you to pray for them, lay hands on them, minister the gospel of Jesus Christ if you're mean. You have got to have the love of God oozing out of you for people to receive what God's word says. Because if you're not exemplifying love, then they're not going to want, I don't want you touching me if you're just mean. If you can't say hello when somebody speaks to you, if you're, uh, if you're so, um, in, so absorbed in yourself that when somebody has a need or a problem that you cannot see that they have a need or a problem unless you want something from them, God is looking for disciples who are going to exemplify love. And you are out there. We are the church. And we have a responsibility to show God's love. So today, I want to help you. I want to help you to love one another. I want to prepare you to join this love revolution that has been started, not just with us, but so many, by so many others who are trying to share how important the love of God is. So I want to teach you today on the subject, love language. So my sermon today is called Love Language. Um, and, and, and as I began to study about the love language, of course, we're focusing on God's love language. I had to do some studying on languages. And I found out some really important things. That in the earth, there are 6,500 estimated languages spoken in this world. And out of the 6,500, English is the number one language. Check this out. 1.132 billion people speak English. However, here's the caveat that there are an estimated 160 dialects of the English language. In America itself, there are 30 dialects. I, now, I know you guys who are from New York, you're going to love this. But New Yorkers, you guys have your own dialect of English. You really do. You speak your own language. You say things a different way. And really, some of the things you say, only you, under, only you, you guys understand and nobody else does. But that's okay because that's your dialect. I'm from Pittsburgh. And sometimes dialects are so, they're so different, even state, even city to city. Because in Pittsburgh, we use different words. You know, we call soda pop in Pittsburgh. We, uh, we don't say, mind your business, you're being nosy. We say you're being nebby in Pittsburgh. We don't call them the Steelers. I know you guys just emphatically, you say it, you articulate it really well, but we call them the Steelers. So it just comes out differently because of where you were raised and how you were raised. Your dialect, your language is different. It affects. And let me just show you that there were two major times, and I'm sure there were countless others, but I want to focus on two major times where language in the scriptures was really, really important and what God had to do to make it, to make the 6,500 number become what it is. If you look at the, the, the book of Genesis, and the story is in the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 9, but I'm just going to read 4 through 9, just so that you can really get an understanding. I'll start at verse 4. It says, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. That's where they messed up, right there, so that they may make a name for themselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building, and the Lord said, if, as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, which is me, which, which he was talking about, walking their pride, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. 
come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not, so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from, from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called, the, called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. At that point, God had to take control of the situation and he had to say, in order for them not to walk in pride, in order for them to not think too highly of themselves, I have to confuse the languages so that they don't all speak the same language. So here we are today and we all speak different languages, but that also communicates in our love language. We all have a different love language. And no, I'm not going to hit you with the five love languages of love. That's not why. That's not what I'm talking about today. We're talking about the, the God's love language, and God's lo love language is simple. is minimized just to one particular precept and one particular principle. But let me tell you about the other time languages were important. In Acts, the second chapter, on the day of Pentecost, they all came together. And starting at verse four, it says, "All of them." were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Verse 5, now there were, now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't they all, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears from them in our own native language? Wow. In one scenario, God has to confuse the languages. And in another scenario, God has, a, has to allow them to hear the language in one, to, um, in one voice, on one accord, of one heart, so that they could receive what was about to happen. It was a promise that God made that he was going to send his Holy Spirit into this earth. And he had to make sure that nobody who was there would miss what he was about to do, because God is not a man that he shall lie. And, and on that day, about 3,000 uh, were saved and added to the kingdom of God. But I want to talk to you today about the process of perfecting your love language. And, and when you are perfecting a language, if I decided that I wanted to learn Spanish, I don't know that much, but I do know hola, senorita. Hola, senor. I don't know a whole lot. Uh, Conchita, I don't know a whole lot of Spanish. But if I decided that I really wanted to learn another language, I would have to go through a process. I would have to take the time to learn this language and go through a process of learning how this language flows, how this language works. And first, I would have to be interested in it. But the first thing we have to do when we're learning a love language God's love language is we have to we have to figure out if we have any language disorders when a child is learning to speak the first thing that you look for is you try to make sure that that child doesn't have any language dis disorders because if they do it will keep them and prohibit them from learning the English language or whatever language they speak uh, proficiently so you try you check your child and you're watching the behaviors and they're you're watching how they uh, conversate with you and how they conversate with others and how they mimic what you say and are they are do they have a stutter um, are they slurring words you look for all of these things that would identify whether or not they had a language disorder order. And as I said earlier, depending on where you are, are from or where you, how you were raised will determine your perspective and your dialect of love language. This is an expressive language disorder that we're talking about, where you may have difficulties finding the right words, where you have limited use of having a complex emotional conversation 
or you just simply un misunderstand love. And this is why. Because many of us grew up in dysfunctional homes. Many of us grew up in families where family feuds were a norm. We grew up where love and affection were a, at a deficit. We grew up where maybe a single mother was raising the children alone and had to be mother and father and had to work all day and didn't really get a chance to pour into our children the way a mother would prefer to. We grew up in homes where fathers were absent, negligent, and financially irresponsible. Responsible. We grew up in homes where physical, emotional, and mental abuse were imminent. Or maybe you grew up in a home where mental health problems were ignored. And then maybe some of us grew up where gifts and things uh, were replacements for presence and true relationship where a hug was a myth or just inconsistent. And last, maybe you just grew up in a home where the words I love you were not exchanged or heard very often. But because we grew up in, in these, dysfunctional, uh, these dysfunctional normalities, we find ourselves in a place where we just really don't understand how to love or how to be loved because we didn't see expressions of love that were healthy. So what happens is that our, 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 our view and our perspective of love is tainted by the situations that we faced as children. So what happened is we're not able to exercise love in words or in action. So what we do is we resort to other resources to learn what love are. Y'all know, we go to social media. Because if you don't know how to love, surely social media will show you how to do that. We go to the, the media version, we go to the commercialized, televised, cinemized, or Netflix version of what true love really is. And what we find is we find people that we think sound or look smart enough to tell us what love really is and what love really should look like. Now listen, I know that art emulates love Life, for those of you who are artists out there, and I get it, but the version of love that you began to fantasize about in your head based on what you see may not be the type of love that you will ever, ever experience. And then what happens is when we don't get that type of love, we get, we get this, we get uh, this, this, uh, we get disappointed because we're, our expectation is that exactly what we see, we can make happen for us. We have unrealistic expectations for the people around us who love us because we think that they're supposed to emulate what we saw on Netflix. But I wanna tell you that we have to be careful where we get our information from. According to 1 John 4 and 1, check this out what the scripture says. It says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Listen, you can't just take everybody's advice on what love is. You wanna know what true love is? Get your Bible and find out what God says about love. God, God's way of love is going to give you a map. It's going to give you instructions of how you need to be loved and how you need to show love. With God, you don't have to guess. He takes all the guesswork out. With everybody else, you do. But with God, you don't have to guess. And I know that we are a technology culture. I know that, that guidance for everything is found on Google and YouTube. If you don't know how to fix a sink, you could go on YouTube and YouTube will tell you how to fix it. You can Google anything to find out information. But what you cannot do is you cannot silence the word of God because God's word will not return back void. God's word stands forever and you cannot exit out. You cannot remove what God's word says about love because what? He is love. So what happens, like I said earlier, is the spiral begins 
because we found ourselves in situations with people who were the enemy begins to attack and he sends people into our life who not only know that we have a, uh, a language disorder, but now they're sent here to they're sent here to expand our language disorder by causing pain in our life. The spiral begins and now you have rejection from somebody who didn't love you back the way you want it to be loved. You have hurt feelings, you have broken hearts, and desperation begins to kick in and we find ourselves loving those people who, uh, who were sent to damage our perception of love even more. So that when we are presented with the love of God, we reject it because trauma and pain that we have experienced have tainted our view of even God's love. And now we can't even receive the love of God. We can't receive the true message of what God did for us and the why he did it. He did it because he loved us. And because he loved us, he gave his life for us. You know the story. I don't have to keep telling it to you over and over again. But the problem is we have a language disorder, a love language disorder. And it causes us to, to take, to have bad communication and accept the wrong people in our lives. And now at this point, we just accept anyone and any thing except for the right one and the right things. How do you correct the language disorder? In the natural, you need a speech therapist. You need somebody who's going to teach you how to say things the way they need to be said, when to say things that need to be said. You need a speech therapist. Well, I want to tell you that one-on-one uh, -on -one speech, therapy, speech therapy session is when you take time in the presence of God, is when you learn how to pray. When you begin to get in the presence of God, when you begin to spend time with God, then you find yourself expanding your love language. You find yourself learning new vocabulary words that express who he is and then you hear the expression of who God says we are by reading his word but by spending time in his presence, by spending time in prayer, you find out how God feels about you because you get to experience God's love in prayer. He comes and meets you. When you call out to him, he finds you right where you are. He doesn't leave you alone. He's a God that will never leave you or forsake you, but he finds you right where you are. Listen, your belief system bleeds through your prayer life. And you've got to know that if your one-on-one -on -one spiritual speech therapy is, is, is not done in prayer, then you are missing out on God sharing with you how he feels about you. You also find, you also have that one-on-one -on -one time in reading God's word, instructions and his word and him giving you clarity on how he sees you. That's when you know who you are in Christ. That's when you embrace who you are in Christ. And that's when you begin to walk out who Christ says you are. That prepares you for the next part of the process. The next part of the process, the second point, is language development. Now it's time, now you're at language development. Language development is when you mature. It's when you grow. It's when you now have reached a point where you've learned the basics and now you're starting to put them into use. Uh, researchers said that uh, an average person can learn 15 vocabulary words in one day. Now, I'm going to admit to you that I do not meet my daily word quota. 15 words a day will not be the, ex I will never meet that expectation. It's not going to happen in my life. But I do, however, learn a word, word a day. I get the Merriam Dictionary and I get a little email that gives me a new word every single day. 
I don't know about you, but do you remember when we were in school and every week, like Monday, your English teacher would give you a list of vocabulary words and you had to learn those vocabulary words, you had to learn the definition, you had to learn the synonyms and the antonyms, depending on who your English teacher was, and at the end of the week, you had a test. You had a quiz. Now, I'm just going to tell you that I always aced those tests because I loved words, and I still do. I love words. I love learning new words. I love expanding my vocabulary. But the truth is that every once in a while, I get stuck on one word for several days. So as those new daily words come in every day, I'm still stuck trying to get a clear understanding and absorb the meaning and usage of certain words. And sometimes you get stuck in the development process. See, the, the crazy part is that people don't even use words these days. They use emojis. Like, I don't know about you, but I can't have, I can't have a text conversation for more than like four or, five, four or five lines. I'm over it. I'm done. I'm picking up the phone and calling you because I want to hear your inflections. I want to hear your tone. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear what, I want to hear the meaning behind your words. And you can hear that when you hear someone's voice. I don't want to talk in emojis. You add in a smiley face at the end of a sentence, I don't even know how to read through sometimes. I don't know if you be being sarcastic. I don't know what, you know, it's too much to read into. Just pick up the phone and call people sometimes. Look at, uh, look at uh, Matthew 22, 37 and 40. Because when people are developing their love language, we first have to learn the basic precepts. And here's the basic precepts, is that Jesus said in verse 37, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. God is telling us how to love one another. And like I said earlier, you don't have to guess. He gives you clear directions. He, love is just that important to him. And Jesus doesn't hope or wish you would love one another, he commands that we love one another. It's non-negotiable. In this particular scripture, it, love is being legislated to us. We have, it's a commandment. God is saying, it's the law that you love me, that you love yourself, and that you love one another. And at that point, you've got to see how important this is to God. And in the in a world where thou shalt not are like the, the, the main focus, in this particular scripture, it's not the thou shalt not, it's the thou shalt. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Thou shalt love thyself, love others the way you love yourself. This is, this, is, this is so important to God, and it's a priority that we love who? One another. Loving one another is how we glorify God. I love, I love this because we get to give God glory by how we love one another. Listen, saints, God has a brand. And I know in this season, everybody's branding themselves. They're, they're branding their, 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 their business. They're branding themselves. They're branding their, their ministry. They're branding their book. They're branding. Everybody's branding themselves. Your Instagram is branded. Your Facebook is branded. Everybody is branding themselves. But we have to look at the consumer perspective, and we must also look at the spiritual perspective. Let me give you an example. Nike has a brand. When you see the swoosh, you know that that is Nike. And Nike goes a step further. They have a slogan, and their slogan is, say it with me, just do it. Just type it in the, type it in the comments, just do it. Now I'm gonna use my Holy Ghost imagination, and I'm gonna tell you that if God had to have a slogan, it would be just love. Just love. I know Nike thinks they got, they got, they got a handle on the, the best slogan in the world, but I'm telling you God has the best slogan. Just love. Type it in the comments. Just love. God has a brand, people. And when we genuinely show God uh, love one another, we are a walking billboard for God.
We are, we are advertisement. When you brand something, you are advertising it, you are promoting it, and you are putting it on display. Loving one another puts God on display. And the difference between a billboard and a fan is that a fan exib exhibits strong admiration and interest for something or someone. But fans seek results, but disciples seek God's will. People loving one another God's way makes us disciples. It is when we become committed, compassionate servants. Let me tell you, let me give you these four ways that, on how to learn a new language. Four ways, four ways. The first is read and learn the Word of God. And according to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 and 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When you read and learn God's Word, you are equipped for the work that God God has called you to do. You are developing your love language. The second thing is to practice the word. If you're going to learn a new language, you can't just read it. You got to practice that word. The scripture says in Joshua 1 and 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall read and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do so everything in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will be successful. Also, look at Philippians 4 and 9. It says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. The third thing, not only do you have to read and learn the word, not only do you have to test yourself, but then you, I'm sorry, not only do you have to practice the word, but then you have to test yourself. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 says, test and evaluate yourself to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourselves, not me, or do you not recognize this about yourselves by an ongoing experience that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit? The last thing is that you have to talk to those who speak the same language. So you got to read and learn the word. You have to practice the word. You have to test yourself. And then you have to talk to those who speak the same love language as you. Uh, Psalms 1, 1 and 2 says, Blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, following their advice and example, not, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit down to rest in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on, this, on his law, his precepts and teachings, he habitually meditates day and night. Listen, you got to stay away from those who have a negative effect on your love language. According to Romans uh, 16, 17 through 18, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but they, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Listen. I know that, that you're getting this, and I know that you understand that c developing a love language is important. But not only do you have to find out and examine whether you have disorders, then you have to develop and mature and strengthen that language. But then the last thing you have to do is you have to become proficient in your language. You have to have language proficiency. Now that you have read and learned the word, practiced, tested yourself, talk to those who speak the same language, you have to become proficient in this language. You know how to speak it, you have to know when to speak it, and you have to know who to speak it to. According to 1 John, 
4, 7, and 8, which is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, my dear friends, we must love each other. There's that word again, one another. We got to love one another. Love comes from God. And when we love each other, it shows that we have been given new life. We are now God's children and we know him. God is love and anyone who doesn't love others has never known him. Wow. God is saying that if you don't love others, if you don't love one another, then you don't even know him. Because like I said and keep saying, God is love. Listen, fluency in any language when you will know, is when you no longer need to think through what you are about to say to one another. When your response is automatic and spirit led. That's when you get ready to when you get ready to say something and instead of you saying what you think you should say, the holy spirit downloads exactly what you should say and how you should say it in the tone you should say it with the right look on your face so that whoever you're saying it to will receive it in love. Listen, loving one another is an unconditional action. You don't get to decide that I'll only love you if you do this for me. I'll only love you if you treat me this way. I'll only love you if you act a certain way or, or you're, a, you're, a, you, you're you are a certain person. You get to love everybody unconditionally. Whether they're on your same pay grade, live on your street, live in the hood, whether they dress like you, act like you, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. When you love one another the way God has intended, then you love them unconditionally. But here's the test, and I'm wrapping it up. Here's the test. The test of fluency is when you have to love those who don't even like you. Oh, I know I am getting, I'm in somebody's business right now. When you, love, love is an intentional choice to do that's what, do what's best for them and for you. So when you have to love somebody who doesn't like you, that's when you are being tested. This is when you have to make a choice. This is when you have to take all of the lessons that you've learned in developing your lang love language and you have to put them into action. And see, the truth is, is that when somebody dislikes you or somebody hates you, uh, you normally, they normally hate you for one of three reasons. One, they see you as a threat. Two, they hate themselves or dislike themselves. Or three, they just want to be you. It's not that simple. I mean, it's that simple that, that people dislike you for reasons that don't make any sense at all. And in life, there will be those who count you out. There will be doubters. There will be haters, as they call them. There will be the non-believers. And then there will be you proving them wrong. <laughs> and that's what you have to do. And the way you prove them wrong is you prove them wrong by showing them God's love. See, it's easy to love those who love you back. It really is. It's easy to love your children because they love you back. It's easy to love your husband when he loves you back. It's easy to love those that you go to church with when they love you back. But it's hard when you have to love somebody who has made a commitment to dislike you. And God puts a demand on you as a disciple to say, it doesn't matter what they do. It matters what you do. Now show them the love of God. This is when the battle chooses you. When you have to love someone who doesn't like you. The battle is choosing you. And you have to love hard even when it's hard to love. And here's the thing. God never uses anyone greatly until he tests them deeply. So the test is that you have to love people who don't love you. And according to Romans 5 and 8, it says, but God showed how much he loved us by having Christ die for us, even though we were sinful. Listen, today, I pray I strengthened and challenged your love language. I pray that this simple message uh, this simple, these simple instructions that I gave you today to confront your and deal with your love disorders, 
um, and not allow your past experiences to taint God's principle of love. I pray that your love development is accelerated and pushes you beyond your own natural limitations and you begin to love those that you didn't even think you had to love. I pray that today that your, that your love can become proficient and that it can become impacting to everybody that you come in contact with. Jesus loved us. Now it's our turn to love one another. I thank you for allowing me to come into your homes today, and I hope you and pray that you are blessed by the word of the Lord on this day, and I hope you can put it into use. I hope you can apply this word to your life and change not only your life, but to everyone that is surrounds you, everyone that God has assigned you to. I pray that you begin to infect people with the love of God. Now, I just want to take a minute to say to those who are out there who don't know Christ, those who need to have Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who are lost, those who he said, I am seeking those who are lost so that I could save them, who may not have been touched by the love of God yet, who may not have experienced the love of God in their childhood and haven't run into just the right disciple to tell them that God's love is real, that God's love saves, that God's love impacts, that God's love changes, that God's love heals. They haven't run into just the right person. Well, today you did. And I want to introduce you to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I want to tell you today that if you make a choice to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior today, your life will never be the same. You will be given the gift of God's love, but then you will also be given the gift of learning to love yourself and then the gift of loving one another. So I invite you to accept Christ into your life. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Father, I need you to save me. I can't do this without you anymore. Come into my heart. Change my life. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. God, I confess my sins to you on this day, and I, I agree with your holy word that declares that you hung on a cross for me and you died for my sins, and three days later you arose just for me because you loved me. And because of what you've done for me and how you loved me, I want to love you back. So today, I don't do it for you, but I do it because of you. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And if you have repeated this prayer with me, amen. If you repeated this prayer with me, you are saved. It's just that easy. It's just that easy that you can accept Christ by praying that prayer with me. I hope you've been blessed by this sermon today. I hope, you, hope you've been blessed by the whole service today. And I hope you come back on Wednesday as, we, as the word is completed from, from last week. It was such a great word that uh, Pastor Brandon gave last week. You don't want to miss the part two this week. He, he really brought an amazing word. And you're going to love what, the rest of what he shares this week. And don't forget, people of God, pray for Texas. We know that Texas is going through a terrible ordeal, ordeal, ordeal right now, and they need us right now to lift them up in prayer and to support them. We are also, uh, we will also make it possible for our disaster relief for you to support our efforts because we're going to find somebody to connect with that we can be a part of, of helping people in Texas right now. Take a look on our, on our website, take a look on our app so that you can get directions of how to support that. And I will see you next time. God bless you and amen.